Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, a couple of qualifiers to begin, I guess. Uh, the first is, uh, yes, I'm from SNHU. No, I have nothing to do with the advertisements you may be seeing. We have a 2,600 student undergraduate uh, traditional day population campus. That's where I'm from. I don't know who those people in the ads are. <laughs> they don't work for us. But. The second thing I wanted to say is to thank David for that story he started with uh, about the birth of his daughter. I was at the February meeting. I, I didn't miss it for any reason like that. But um, I have to say, I, I've had moments like that where I've been working on, on this project and doing the work that we normally do, and I have two small children, and I, and I think that, um, I really hope that when they're in college, they have faculty who are as dedicated to honing the craft as the people in this room, the people in my profession are. Um, like I think most people in this room, I have the occasion every semester to be teaching people who will be teachers. And that really drives home for me the fact that I want my, my children to be in front of people who are very well prepared and dedicated. Uh, and so I, I sort of take that as a, as a motivator in some ways, when I'm lacking one, uh, to do this job and to do it really as well as I can. I don't want to speak for terribly long. I know we're behind schedule, which is no surprise. Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about how SNHU in our sort of day campus, in our traditional campus, uh, took the AAUP LEAP initiative and uh, built upon that a new general education program. Uh, I have a, a handout. There are not enough of them. I apologize. I didn't expect such a great crowd on Thursday morning. But they are the salmon-colored uh, handouts that are floating around. Perhaps some of you could share. The first page of which is uh, this. It is the LEAP initiative itself, the essential learning outcomes. You can't read that from where you are, but that's what it looks like. Um, if you've <clears throat> seen it, I think most people in this room have seen it and know uh, what it is. Uh, the AAUP devised this scheme of sort of four essential learning outcomes and the, the measures that would be embedded within those as a guide, uh, really, for any program devoted to the liberal arts and to liberal education. Um, the emphasis here is uh, on outcomes rather than disciplinary distribution requirements. Here I must also note that uh, you'll hear a lot of resonance with, to what Kay was talking about in her talk. We had sort of similar experiences, I think, in that regard. Um, those who crafted our program at SNHU use this as the model, but as Kay was saying, they had to leave their disciplinary shibboleths at the door in order to do so. They had to walk away from the turf uh, and start talking more along the lines of competencies and skills and what the role of their particular disciplines could be in delivering those kinds of things. When I arrived at SNHU four and a half years ago, this program was largely underway, by which I mean it was almost done, um, at least the superstructure of the program. Um, <clears throat> so part of my job was to take the history major and also the history courses and calibrate them to this new uh, general education environment. What you will see on some of the subsequent pages are how SNHU chose to interpret the LEAP document. And I've sort of put a little schematic up here for you to take a look at. Uh, the four LEAP areas are on the left. What we did with our general education program is actually break those down into six. Um, so the three areas in the knowledge, <clears throat> the three, uh, uh, that sort of is, is sort of one area, the three beneath that would be three separate and then the two at the bottom align almost directly to what the LEAP initiatives were. We decided, after I don't know how much conversation, uh, that yes, knowledge was actually something that was important. Uh, one of the challenges of the conversation about skill-based learning is that it can be often easy to forget that, uh, which is not to say you don't value it, it's that it's so apparent to us that we maybe forget to embed it. Uh, but in fact, we, we went very deliberately in the direction of embedding it in these three particular areas, arts and humanities, social behavioral and sciences, uh, and STEM, which doesn't have an E at my place. It's uh, just there, there as a placeholder, science, technology, and mathematics at SNHU. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> so all of these areas have their own kind of assessment rubrics built into the gen ed program for that top category of the knowledge, arts, humanities, 
for each of the courses that we put in, we have to develop a rubric because it is content specific. Right? It is not simply skill based, it's actually content specific. So that becomes a, a charge of, of our department for all of our courses to develop those kinds of things. Um, and each course in our general education program must meet at least three of these six outcomes, must demonstrate where and how it is going to meet these various outcomes. So this is all well and good, and I arrive and I look at this and I say, well, this is interesting. But if you're like me, you're going to ask a very simple question. Where did the history requirement go? And this is, again, that thing we have to keep coming back to when we're engaging in gen ed reform from a, from a competency perspective rather than from a distribution requirement perspective. That we have to think more about what gets delivered, not just in terms of content, but in terms of the skill and, and those various kinds of outcomes. <clears throat> the challenge was simple. How do we make history present in general education in this new gen ed? in new, different, and impactful ways. And I wanted to focus on that third of those, the really impactful part. How, in other words, could we take this new challenge and transition it, instead of being defensive about it, and say, well, maybe this is an opportunity for history to have an even greater role in general education. Uh, so we were faced with a choice. And we made a, a choice that I think some people might find challenging, but uh, nonetheless was the choice we had to make. The first was we lifted all prerequisites on all history courses, except for our two methodology courses, uh, our historiography class and our senior thesis class. The second, the follow-up to that, was to embed every history course in general education somewhere. Every single history course that we offer, except for the methods courses, can be taken for gen ed credit somewhere in gen general education. That'll make more sense in just a minute. And the third was to alter some of our existing courses and develop new ones so as to appeal to the audience. Right. And here's where we had to get a little bit creative with names uh, and with topics and with devising courses that could be taught one semester by somebody who is a European historian and another semester by somebody who is an Asian historian, so my colleague uh, developed a course on it called uh, <clears throat> Dictators of the Modern Era. This is one of those that can be sort of uh, shifted from one person to the other. And then he looked at me as the Americanist and he said, I don't know what you would do with Dictators of the Mo Modern Era. And I said, well, I'd start with Walmart and then I'd go from there. Uh, we also have phased out Western civilization in favor of world history and in favor of a world civ course. This was something students, believe it or not, were expressing an interest in. So that was also an area where we, where we were willing to do that. So the question of what happened to the history requirement, the answer is the requirement's gone, but history is, ev is everywhere that it can be in our program. This is also one of the sheets on the handout. Right? All of the blue lines point to where history courses live in our new gen ed matrix. We have our own category, that's box C up there. Right? Students can choose one, they have to choose two courses from four different humanities disciplines, fine arts, history, politics, and philosophy. But beyond that, we also have a very strong presence in this bottom category. This is the fourth of the LEAP goals. It's the sixth one on our list, integration, application, and reflection. We devised a series of integration clusters where students had to take three courses from a bunch of courses on a theme. And this is where we said, aha, this is, this is where history as the great integrative discipline can really have a very large presence. And so we have tried and we continue to try to slot ourselves in as many of these different ideas as possible. These clusters will evolve over time. Some of them will fade away. Uh, not surprisingly, the most popular one is pop culture. Uh, so we have to find a way to get in there. Uh, we have since added one that I put in red down there, number nine, War and Peace. That's something we developed. So there are six history courses in that one cluster. Right. This is the kind of thing that, that the Gen Ed reform has asked us to do, has required us to do, is to think creatively about the ways and the places where history can live to, de to, to deliver the goals of the program. And if that means surreptitiously they learn something about history along the way, then the, all the better. Okay. That's kind of our, our approach to this. 
Nonetheless, with all of this, there are some things that we know are positive impacts, there are some things that we know might not be desirable, and there's a lot we don't know about what we don't know, right? about what's going to happen. This is a new program, we're still collecting all kinds of data. Um, the ability of non-history students to jump directly to two and 300 level classes is a challenge. We don't know how that's going to work out. Uh, but we have to be prepared for it. Okay? The reality is they probably won't do too much of it anyway. They'll probably skew closer to the 100 level classes if they're not majors or if they don't major in something like politics or literature, it's one of our cousin disciplines. We don't know how this will affect our total enrollments. Uh, we're still sorting that out. Will we lose students overall? Will we gain them? Will we have to offer more of one and not of another? We don't know that. Uh, will some students be able to graduate from the university never taking a history course? Yes. That's true. Uh, we like to think we're putting up as many roadblocks as possible for that happening. Right? What will happen with these integration clusters and how much of a proactive role can we play in creating new ones and making ourselves uh, the driving force? That's something that I'm making a bit of a priority. Where's this line between foundation versus exploration on that sheet that you have? Can we move that line a little bit and put history competency, history literacy as a foundation uh, for any educated individual? It has opened up the possibility of double major. History works as a very easy double major, not easy in terms of rigor, but easy to schedule double major for our students. And it's opened up opportunities for all kinds of team teaching within our department and with other departments as well, because we're not quite saddled as much as we were with teaching a raft load of 100 level classes. Now we can do some really creative things at the 200 level as well. So there are some upsides to this, there are some things that are uncertain, there are things we, we lose, but in the end I like to think that we're trying to use this framework as a way of uh, delivering history in some different ways uh, to students in that they may not otherwise have had access to. I know we're running short, so I'm going to pause there, and I'll certainly be willing to take questions afterwards, and certainly privately if you'd like. Okay, thank you. Pretty brief, because I just wanted to give you an example of more of the external changes, or the externally driven changes that are coming to my colleges and to a lot of community colleges in Texas. I see one person here who teaches at a community college in Texas, and two, okay. Um, just a, a review about history and we call it the core curriculum. Yes, that's what I mean for general education. At my college in the last five years, we've had two things kind of driving the changes. First is SACS, which is, at, that's the accreditation agency, which has been asking us increasingly, putting pressure on us to measure student learning outcomes. And now we have to measure program learning outcomes. And then second is the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, which has mandated course outcomes for freshman and sophomore level courses, and now has also mandated a new core curriculum. So history of Texas Community Colleges, this is about it. <clears throat> this is what we teach. Um, US History, Texas History, World Civ, and Western Civ. Uh, part of the core curriculum is a six hour, we're still doing the credit hours, of American history. And you can substitute Texas history for one of those. The other courses that we make it to teach fall under what used to be called humanities, but are now called language, philosophy, and culture. So the learning outcomes that the state has told us we must do in our US history surveys are as follows very um, skills driven and for world history I teach that so I'm including this it's kind of the same thing however the state has said according to the new requirements of the core curriculum that history classes have to map to these larger goals which are inspired by LEAP which I didn't know that. I had to figure that out on my own. <laughs> um, critical thinking, communication, personal responsibility, um, and social responsibility. So we had to 
We were then told to write some more learning outcomes. These weren't dictated by the state. These were developed at San Antonio College um, for US history and world history. For personal responsibility, we went with the praise of choices, actions, and consequences of ethical decision making in historical context, pretty broad. And for social responsibility, for US history, we went more with the civic engagement idea. And for world history, we went more for the global, um, global learning idea. This is the distinguish specific regions of the world from each other. Now, according to Sachs, we're supposed to um, measure program outcomes, how students have done in a program. And what our colleges decide to do is measure learning outcomes for the entire core curriculum instead of having it broken down into a history major or an English major. Because we're a two-year college, so the vast majority of our students will you know, complete hopefully complete the core, uh, more likely um, go on somewhere else and take classes in their major. Uh, this is something that we're supposed to start this spring, and I put in charge, put in charge of a committee to basically say, should we go with this, or should we just completely scrap it, or should we tweak it? But the idea will be that um, every course will have to match up as something that's introducing this core component, like critical thinking, or it's reinforcing it, or it's comprehensive, and I have this all on a handout. And if you look at the handout, excuse me. I tried to, and it kind of bled from the first to the second page, look at critical thinking, for example, and in bold I put down things that history courses do, our outcomes do. And then I put in italics things that we probably could do, we probably should be doing. And what this is really making us rethink is assessment. And that's something that we in Tuni we've been talking a lot about outcomes, but we hadn't necessarily talked about assessment. And that's the real tricky part. How do you assess this? Um, and the thing I'm trying to work on is that assessment is not necessarily about a grade. It can be, but it's not necessarily a grade. But it has to be something measurable. So I've been really struggling with these LEAP initiatives, and particularly the personal responsibility. Um, I think uh, most of my colleagues have just disengaged from the process because they say they are content specialists. Um, so I put down a couple examples that I just was hoping maybe somebody might give me some feedback about dealing with personal and social responsibility. And those are in the handout there. One I tried as a homework assignment. I tried not to make it a big part of the grade. I told the students it would count as their class, part of their class participation, and so less than half of them did it. So um, what were you going to say? I'm just wondering where these handouts are. Huh? I'm just wondering where these handouts are. Oh, I'm sorry. So um, anyway, in conclusion, that's all I wanted to present to you that in, in Texas, at least in my experience, this is all kind of coming down to us and we're being forced to react if we want to be accountable to this. So um, I guess I'll wait for some of your questions and comments afterwards. I have a handout. I don't know whether there are enough of them, but if you uh, uh, are electronically connected, I posted it on the community uh, site for the uh, uh, for the tuning grant, so that way you can uh, do it. I did that because I also posted all of the all of the handouts I posted in a PDF on the teaching and learning uh, community on the ASU website. If you log in as an ASU member, um, you can access them after today. Uh, that way. Okay. Don't worry. Yeah. And I did that because I uh, used this really as an opportunity to. Uh, show some of the documents that we are dealing with uh, because uh, part of our instructions were to uh, uh, let other people see what we are dealing with in our particular uh, situation. Uh, I really am here to um, be a bit of a negativist uh, and uh, I've been personally involved with the tuning project from a very early uh, time and uh, I'm 
very excited about it. I'm, it has been very good to be in that pilot group. It has made me personally rethink and redo things in ways that I otherwise never would have. But the real problem that I'm facing and that I want to bring up is how do we bring up the rest to where we are? And are, can we indeed be confident in the end that the next generation of our children, grandchildren, and students indeed will encounter the same kind of opportunities through education that we have had and that, we have, that have made us privileged? So uh, in uh, Indiana, somewhat like in Texas, uh, there has been, even though there have been pockets of tuning that have been very interesting and pockets of thinking about teaching that have been very interesting and fruitful, there has been nothing systematic until the state basically dictated there's, that there's going to be a transferable core that pertains to all public institutions. Uh, and what I'm really trying to do very briefly is to uh, uh, outline what that meant for us in the history department at uh, IUPUI and some of the concerns that come with it. Um, the um, legislature, in part driven by the announcement by Lumina, uh, since they're both uh, housed in the same town, namely in Indianapolis, uh, really took to heart that we need more people uh, to have degrees and we need more students to complete their degrees. So it is the completion agenda that is driving what is happening to a very, very large extent in Indiana, at least at the public institutions at Indiana. And uh, that most of my colleagues in any of the, at any of the public institutions really have had no interest in looking or revising their curriculum until they basically were uh, uh, held accountable at an extraordinarily fast rate. The um, state uh, passed the bill a year before implementation. Any of you who've had any roles in administration, whether as chairs, as deans, or whatever, you cannot have something implemented within a year because that is far too fast. We had to do it, we did it, we did it badly. And so time is of the essence, but time that also allows the slackers not to do what they're supposed to do. Namely, uh, they, can, uh, they can just fall back into their old grooves and be very comfortable with it. So uh, the, uh, it was in the case of Indiana, the Commission for Higher Education that took, the, the, uh, took it upon itself to create the framework for the public institutions for a statewide transferable core. 30 credit hours divided in a particular way, uh, and this particular way, and it will come and has been addressed in different ways, put history at a really awkward position because uh, according to the Commission for Higher Education, it was part of the social sciences, behavioral sciences. My colleagues in my department understand themselves as humanists, and so what do we do with it? And that is not calculating what did my own institution do where we have a sort of uh, fungible uh, distribution requirement where we have broad categories into which we can count history, somewhat like te Texas, it can show up under certain conditions, and, and uh, New Hampshire, it can up under certain conditions in this category and others in this. This does not mean that it is a nightmare for the registrar. And if you have any idea what that then, what the reverberations are, is how do, you how do you do advising with that? How do you create the right kinds of uh, degree templates that allow students to know what to do and where to count it, how to count it? So those are some of the real problems that, that uh, we have. And uh, I'm very sad to say, because the time was so fast in which we had to accomplish this, that what the original thought of the task force uh, to create a general education core at IUPUI, uh, instead of coming up with something that we could all agree upon, that uh, we could brand as some of our marketing people uh, would have loved us to do, uh, it became a uh, race for the, uh, for the turf, and it became a smorgasbord, and it was most certainly not bloodless, it continues to be tough battles because everybody who teaches anything on the 100, maybe 200 level, wants to be part of that core because they think it's critical that those courses are in that core. 
So this is something where the whole campus needs, and we are a campus of over 30,000 students, so, uh, and a lot of professional schools, so the understanding on, and the sympathy for anybody uh, who assists on liberal education across the curriculum has a very hard time making that argument. And if you don't have time to get that respect, get that knowledge to your colleagues, it's very hard to, to defend it because as, as soon as we defend it, we tend to become defensive and that gets into those turf wars that are very hard to, uh, to do. The, um, the other sad part is that uh, now that we checked off the transferability of the first 30 credit hours, we're now working with two years to do it uh, on the transferability of 60. And uh, that uh, creates how do we uh, actually create programs that lock, stock, and barrel can be transferred from one institution to the other. And so it is quite possible for somebody at one institution to get uh, the first two years transferred to, in one fashion, transferred to another institution, and really miss the, those areas that lead them to the upper, two, uh, upper division courses. I don't quite know how this is going to work. I think uh, we are trying hard, but there are really no institutional mechanisms in place to make that happen seamlessly for the student. Uh, the concern that uh, we have is that Indiana created what is called a core transfer library, where faculty, because the lingo, the PR is always, it's faculty driven, that is really not true faculty are reacting to these things, uh, that uh, the <coughs> core transfer library is a panelists of faculty who uh, look at syllabi and judge by syllabi whether those courses are actually transferable from one public institution to another. This is a good beginning because it does get faculty to talk to each other and faculty of different institutions to talk to each other. What it does not allow for is anything but looking very narrowly at the comparability of syllabi because there are no resources either by the commission or by the institutions to give faculty that time, that opportunity to do what in the literature about the, uh, the, the reason why the Finnish teachers are so much better because there's faculty development, there's professional development. We do not have this as part of faculty development. We do not recognize this as uh, something that uh, is rewarded, that is, and hence it gets done because we have to do it. But it does not get done with a resonance, with the impact that it really should have. So uh, it remains small rather than broad. The, uh, for the uh, institution, what has happened, I, IUPUI is part of a uh, system. The IU system is pretty large, close to 100,000 students, very different kinds of institutions within the system, and we are very proud, uh, according to our president, that each of the campuses uh, has a differentiated mission. In other words, the flagship is most certainly different than the other ones, and uh, then we have schools that are core schools, schools that are system schools, cores that are independent schools, so it's a, as my chancellor says, it's a complex system. Uh, that's one way to describe it, uh, and it's, but it's no way to administer it well. Uh, and so uh, the question remains for us to find out how are we going to measure, what kind of data are useful, who is going to do it, and what, are the, what, are the, what is the impact and what is the follow-up on those things. And uh, I think what stands out most to me is that Indiana also, because of the commission, and I think for all the right reasons, has become a leap state. But we have not learned to articulate and look at the vocabulary that LEAP uses as opposed to the vocabulary that each and every other campus is, let alone the programs use. In other words, we now need, we need and you have seen some of the examples, we need translation tables. We are pretty good. We are. We are the proverbial good students. You good us, give us a task, we do it, and we tend to do it well. But we live in a system where few of the people are good students. And that's where the system breaks down. And I think what we need to think about collectively, how can we make it understandable, exciting, 
and workable to those who are not good students. And that's the challenge that I see. And uh, so we are falling into those administrative units or those commission units that give us what should a degree plan look like. Lumina is the most obvious and most probably the most powerful example of articulating what degree maps the uh, quality, the, the degree qualification uh, uh, project is one of those, or profile is one of the, is the ultimate degree map. How do they translate? How do they, they uh, and uh, this is where I think that what we do and do not do well is that we make our students understand why they're doing what they're doing. I don't think we give them the help and the opportunity to really know and ask the right questions that go yes to that question of how do I get my first job, but how do we get them to think about careers, how do we think about, I let them think about lifelong learning, which is now no longer a word that you want to say loudly because it has become debased currency, and yet it's a principle that we all prescribe to because that's what makes us tick. That's what makes us continue with these tasks. And so it is really, really important, but we need to find language that employers, that students, and that parents, and in my case, or that politicians understand. Because there, I think, uh, in addition to that wonderful uh, example of, of engaging the employers, I think we need to engage the politicians in what it means what we are doing, why we are doing it, and why it is good what we are doing, and why we are the ones who should do that? I have three suggestions for um, paying close attention to in, the, in our discussions. And one is that may seem exceedingly obvious, and that is uh, syllabi, paying attention to syllabi and assignments. And uh, I don't know what your departments do, but my department has had a very long uh, history of publishing their syllabi. And I think it's one of the best ways of being transparent about transferability, if you will. But that also means we have to pay very different attention to syllabi. I just was involved in a project in scoring syllabi, and uh, so I read um, about 100 across the gen ed curriculum, and I can tell you I'm embarrassed for my colleagues, because most of the syllabi are very, very poor. They don't get across what they want to teach. They don't articulate what student learning outcomes are. They don't articulate how they get there. So uh, that is one area where I think we can, and somebody brought that up already, that we need to learn what our student, what our colleagues in social, in math, in political science, in all of the gen, and what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how they are articulating it. Because if students get one syllabus from a sociologist, one from a historian, and they speak totally different languages, not even to think about psych and, uh, and uh, math, I think we are losing the students, we are losing what Gen Ed is supposed to do, namely to be a cohesive and well thought out entity. It becomes to, a, a way to check off parts, and that is not really very helpful. So I really do hope that uh, we uh, look at our syllabi assignments and use the rubrics that many of you have developed and are working on as one way of making it very clear what it means, how do we use them, and how we can improve upon them. And that is, uh, just as a side note, the English distinguish between evaluation and assessment. And I think it's very important for us to remember that we as teachers evaluate our own courses and our own programs very differently than institutions assess what we're doing well or not doing well, whether it's by productivity or whether it's by uh, outcomes or employability or whatever other uh, metrics there might be. So we should be very careful, again, to use the language. The other part uh, is really uh, that I just want to mention is where we, I hope, have discussions, and that is from my uh, experience as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, that unless and until we are making what we're doing here in tuning or what anybody who's working on curriculum and on course and program improvement in whatever shape or form, if we do not find ways to uh, reward and recognize those tasks, not in a tangible, not in a uh, tangential, but in a tangible fashion, whether it's in annual reports, whether it's in uh, merit pay, whether it's in promotion, 
we are going to be doomed because uh, there is far too much that each and every one of us is doing that we are not we will not be able to have those conversations uh, that take time that take time to be informed communication is really really uh, awkward situation because very often what does not filter down what faculty know, faculty will not tell what deans should know, and if you go up to the provost level, the provosts very often have no idea what is happening on the one and two hundred level courses or first and second year courses. And so if we have to manage that communication loop, so those are the three things that I hope that we in the future will have conversations about, and thank you. Uh, I appreciate the, the, the discussion today, and it reminds me of something I read a few months ago, and I can't remember the publication. It was something related to the AAC and you that was talking about analytical thinking, and it, and it was trying to pose a simple question about, we all think we're teaching analytical thinking, and yet employers report massive amounts of, of problems with their ability to say that student, that their employees can think analytically. Um, and so someone did just a simple survey similar to what this question about translation was and asked academics to define the words analytical thinking and they asked employees to define analytical thinking. And so the majority of academics responded to something along the lines of what we might call logic, thinking about fallacious arguments, finding bias, reasoning um, in terms of argument, whereas employees tended to respond along the lines of what we might call problem solving, thinking about how to think out of a box, finding a fast and workable solution, um, and, and so these two definitions are just so diametrically opposed in some ways that, that it may indicate that, that, that this lack of communication is going to be a problem for all of us. And so I, I think you hear a lot of, of what we're talking about today is just simply defining terms. And, and that's a lot of what the tuning projects I'm trying to think about is to think about how you define terms and how you define terms for multiple audiences because sometimes Language is slippery that way, but uh, that's just, I, I, I wish I remembered the citation, but I just, I can't. Um, let me open the floor. We have some time before we all can recharge with some coffee. Um, so anyone, comments, questions, thoughts? We're in the way of coffee. <laughs> I know. Uh, All right. Well, then, if that's the case, please refuel, recharge. Thank you for thank you for your time. Thank you to, the, to our second panel.